Hey everybody, welcome back to Smart Robots Review, the show that reviews robotics and other fantastic tech from around the world. I'm your host Elias, and as you can see, I'm still in my hotel room, which means I'm still at NASA, Cape Canaveral, Florida. And unfortunately, the bad news is that the launch today of the Falcon 9 rocket did not happen. It got postponed until Wednesday, April 18th. So until that time, I'm going to be here and hopefully on the second attempt, the rocket will take off and bring the tests planet hunting satellite up into orbit. So that'd be pretty exciting. I'm going to be here and hopefully I'll bring you that live. So in the meantime, since we don't have a cool launch to share with you, I do have another video. This is Professor Zach Berta Thompson, assistant professor with University of Colorado Boulder. He will talk about how we gather and analyze exoplanet data. So enjoy that video. And I want to make sure I thank my sponsor, JLC PCB. These guys are great. With that, let's continue with Zach Berta Thompson, professor from the University of Colorado, Boulder. So now we get to do a little bit of show and tell, and so uh, this is gonna be exciting. So uh, we're gonna look at how uh, the data gets gathered and, and how we identify exactly what are these exoplanets out there. Uh, and so with that, we've got uh, Zach Berta Thompson here, uh, who's an assistant professor with the University of Colorado, Boulder. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to, to take the chance to try to give a sense of like what, what exactly is TESS doing, what are the observations we're getting, um, uh, how do those tell us that there are planets there? And so to do that, uh, we, need to, we need to back up a little bit. We need to talk about the distance between stars and why it is hard to find planets. So uh, let's imagine shrinking down the entire universe so that we can fit the sun into this room. The sun will be the size of this light bulb, um, which will hopefully turn on. Great. Um, uh, and so if this is the sun, we of course know that there are millions, talk billions, of other stars out there in the Milky Way galaxy. So we can ask, where would the closest star be if this is our sun? The closest star would be a few thousand kilometers away from us, right? Uh, like in, in Colorado, if we're here in Florida. So if we want to find a tiny little planet um, that's going to be pretty faint, I've made this one particularly big so that we can see it by a factor of 10, maybe 100. Um, it's going to be really, really hard to see this planet next to this very bright star from halfway across the country, right? So that's a hard thing. That's not what TESS is going to be doing. What we're going to do with TESS is we're going to take advantage of those few random systems that happen to be lined up so that as planets are orbiting around their star, they pass in front of the star as seen from Earth. So there's this little transit, that's where the transiting, transit in transiting next to the planet's <laughs> satellite comes from. Um, this transit of the planet passing in front of the star. And we still don't get to take a picture of this planet in front of the star, its little silhouette, but we can look for the brightness of this star dimming when the planet is passing in front of it and blocking some of its light. So to be able to find a planet, all we would need to do would be able to measure the brightness of a star very carefully. If we could bring up my first slide here, um, I can emphasize that this is something that astronomers have been pretty good at for a long time now. Um, for example, um, uh, Henrietta Leavitt, my scientific hero, uh, she's the one on the left with the magnifying glass there, um, working about a century ago, made repeated brightness measurements of a particular kind of variable star, Cepheid variables, and used those variable stars to figure out how to measure their intrinsic brightness. Other astronomers then went out, used her work, used those stars to measure the distance to other galaxies, uh, determine the fact that the universe is expanding, and like learn the age of the universe, um, all from these brightness measurements of stars. And so she had to do this work. Actually, we could bring the next slide up again. Um, she had to do this work with photographic plates. Um, so these are glass plates, stars imprinted on, on them um, from a telescope. And she had a little fly swatter with reference stars that she would compare to by eye to make these brightness measurements. And so this is hard work. And she made beautiful measurements out of these data. Um, Tess, like the Kepler mission before it, is building on this legacy of stellar photometry, of measuring the brightness of stars. Of course, TESS is using extremely sensitive CCD cameras instead of photographic plates. TESS can observe millions of stars at once, and TESS can measure the brightness of those stars to a precision that is much better than anything we could ever hope to, to do from the ground. And so TESS is really, you can think of TESS as taking a movie of the sky, essentially, over this really big field of view. If we can bring up the next animation, I want to show you a little snippet of that movie. 
Uh, so on the left here, there's uh, I've pulled out just a few pixels of some simulated data. And this is, uh, let's see, the pixels you're seeing there has a few stars in there. That is about one one hundred thousandth of all of the pixels that Tess will have at any one time. And you can see in the center, there's one little star there that's winking out occasionally. And the reason that star is winking out is that we've imagined that there is an impossibly big planet passing in front of it, so a planet that is basically blocking out all of the light of the star. So its brightness drip, drops to zero. And you can see that in the light curve of this brightness as a function of time. Uh, brightness going from 100% all the way down to zero. Of course, as I said, real planets are smaller than this. They won't block all of the star's light. So if we go to the next animation, I've replaced that enormous planet with a, can we go on to the next, please? Ah, perfect, there we go. Um, and notice on here, the scale has shifted. So now uh, we're seeing a tiny little dip in the brightness of the star that is a quarter of a percent. So this is actually an Earth-sized planet transiting out a fairly small star, so a star that's much smaller than the sun. Um, but if you look at the movie, you can't see anything happening at all. You don't see that star in the center winking out. That's because it's a very, very tiny change in the brightness that we're looking for when these small planets transit in front of their stars. And so TESS, because it has such exquisite precision, has the ability to measure that transit and tell that, that there's a planet there. So with TESS, we'll be able to find planets through this technique. We can also, as you can imagine, figure out the size of the planet because we know the fraction of starlight that the planet blocks, right? But we can also get the orbital period. We can tell how frequently does the planet pass in front of the star. And if you have an orbital period, you can make the beautiful demographic plots that Jesse showed us earlier. Um, you can also figure out how far away the planet is from its star um, by the laws of gravity. And so therefore, how much heat that planet receives from its star, and therefore, what, roughly what temperature that planet is. And so that's how we can tell, even with test data alone, roughly what, how, you know, is this planet way too hot for liquid water? Is it too cold for liquid water? Is it just about right for liquid water? So that's, there's a lot that you can learn um, from test data, and even just looking at single points of light. So I'll uh, leave it there and take any questions. Wonderful. Who's got questions about test data? All right, we'll go here. How do you uh, ensure that the dip in brightness you're looking at is from an actual planet and not like a sunspot or something that's with the rotation of the, sun or the star? Rather? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. If we could actually bring up my last uh, animation again. Um, exoplanet astronomers aren't the only astronomers out there, right? There, there are astronomers that are interested in everything. There are astronomers who are really interested in, in sunspots and star spots on other stars. Um, and so TESS, on the first, on one hand, is going to get a lot of really beautiful light curves of star spots on stars. And so we'll be able to teach us about the physics of stars through those. But if you look at this light curve here, a transiting planet has a very characteristic dip. It's a very tiny fraction of the planet's orbit, where the planet is actually in front of the star, as seen from you. Most of the rest of the orbit, the star just looks pretty ordinary. And so you're looking for just this boxy little dip in the, in the brightness of the star. A star spot will be rotating with the, I wish I had a worse light bulb here. Um, <laughs> a star spot will be rotating on the surface of the star, so it'll spend like roughly half of the rotation period of the star in view. And so you'll see this sort of smoother modulation in the brightness of the star overall. All right, just a reminder, if you're watching online at home, we're taking your questions using the hashtag AskNASA. Feel free to uh, send those in, and we'll uh, get to those here in the room. Um, so other questions about the data that Tess is going to be collecting here. And what is the smallest dip in brightness that would still be statistically significant for Tess? So for um, uh, that dip that I was showing, there was about a quarter of a percent in bright brightness. Um, our sensitivity will depend on the brightness of the star that we are looking at. Um, but for very bright targets, we'll be able to detect dips that are, um, uh, let's see, so smaller than, eh, down at about the level of 0.01%, um, so 100 parts per million. Um, and th so those are the smaller transit that you can detect, the smaller planet that you can find. And so though astronomers, myself included, have been looking at many of these, these nearby stars, um, looking for planets around them, a lot of us have been doing that from the ground. And so we've only been able to see dips that are like 1% deep. And so the, the real moon from TESS is being able to find these much, much smaller dips to find, be able to find much, much smaller planets, which we know, thanks to Kepler, are enormously more abundant than the large planets. All right, last question we're going to pull from uh, Ask NASA here. 
I have a question online from Lisa Murray. What factors will allow the optional 18-year mission extension? Uh, so the the spacecraft itself um, uh, should continue to work beautifully um, if, if everything goes according to plan. Um, and so really that will be continued funding to be able to support the scientists who are making the, um, are making the, the operations continue, analyzing the data, um, running the spacecraft. Um, and so there, I think this is, this is a mission that, that an extended mission for test could be enormously beneficial to the community. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for showing us the transit message here.